Hello everybody, what's up? Once again, this is Tim here with my review for the shitty for shit tastic for the shitty shit tastic sequel, Friday the thirteenth, a new beginning, baby. Let's jump right into this fucker. Here's my deluxe edition copy of it. Like I said, I own even the shittiest of sequels. I don't mind this uh this cover here with like Jason's mask over top of the Pinehurst house. That's cool, I don't mind that deluxe edition. Okay, let's jump right into this here. Um Film was directed by Danny Steinman. Now, Danny Steinman, he was a low. He's he directed a porno before he directed this, so that should give you an idea of what kind of uh, Friday Thirteenth, you know, style for this film you're in for. This is such. This film feels so sleazy and so trashy that it's just unbelievable. I mean, I wouldn't mind the sleazy and trashiness feel. I'm not knocking it because of that. I'm knocking it because it's lazy, sleazy, and trashiness, and it's not fun. But uh. Music by Harry Manfredini. I think the score is only decent. It's only decent. I don't think it's anywhere near as good as the one from 1, 2, 3, or 4. I think it's only decent. But I still like Harry Manfredini. Sue me. Uh, got Corey Feldman in this film for basically a cameo appearance. Tara is reborn. Special features, commentary with the director, Danny Steinman, with cast and crew. The commentary on this film is funny as fuck. I recommend buying this only for the commentary. As far as Danny Steinman goes, it's not a very good director. His style for this film and everything wind up as pure shit. I'm sad that the guy passed away, but this film is still not good. But he's hilarious. To be honest, he should, he, he should do a lot more interviews and stuff, just telling jokes and shit, than he should, like, directing-wise, because this film is just bad. It's, it's bad. It's a bad movie. It's the worst in the entire franchise. Second worst is Jason Takes Manhattan. This is first. Um, it's got commentary. Lost Tales from Camp Blood. Part 5. The Crystal Lake Massacre Revisited Part 2. The making of the film. An original theatrical trailer. Okay. Now let's set this over here. Like I said, Danny Steinman. I, like, I mean, he seems like a decent guy. I like the guy. He's funny on the commentary. He's fucking hilarious. I enjoy listening to him. I watch this film, honestly, just for the commentary. Uh, he's funny as shit. I like the guy. I wouldn't mind hanging out with him. He seems like a decent guy, but the film still sucks. That doesn't take away from the fact that the film sucks. Uh, but to jump straight into the film, uh, you got a dream sequence at the beginning of it. I like this dream sequence. <clears throat> Just because this film is bad doesn't mean there's not stuff in it that I like. I enjoy the dream sequence at the beginning of it. Corey Feldman, like, out in the woods, like, shining a flashlight, uh, in the, in the woods, and it's, like, raining and it's wet everywhere, and you got these two guys that come there and they're like, they're at Jason's grave, and they're fucking, let's get a look at the main man, baby. And they start digging him up, and uh, you got his corpse lying there with a mask on and everything. Even he's got all his gear with him, which I thought was funny. He he stabs one guy in the neck and stabs the other dude in the gut with a machete. Decent, decent kills. Um, but of course, not really kills. It's a dream sequence, but I still like the way it's played. And then he raises up out of the grave in a really cool-looking way. And then gets up out of the grave and it starts walking around and he eyes Corey Feldman in the woods like who who's been watching the whole thing. Comes with the Corey Feldman, lifts up the machete, gets ready to swing at him, swings and bam! You cut uh, out of it and find out it's a dream sequence. Cut to uh, uh, you cut to the new Tommy. Uh, I think the actor's name maybe John Shepard. I'm not for sure. Uh, I for, I forgot I forgot what his name was because this film sucks so bad. But uh, he does good. I like this guy though. He does good playing Tommy. He's he's good. The uh, Reggie the Reckless character in here, he's a kid from Different Strokes, I believe. Uh, he's fine. And the woman that plays Pam is decent. Uh, but the rest of the cast, garbage. Garbage. Except for, so wait, hold on. Except for Ethel and Junior. Ethel and Junior are funny as fuck in this movie. They are my two favorite characters of this entire film. They are so fucking hilarious. But uh, we'll get to them. So they're transporting him to this place. They're transporting Tommy Jarvis to this place called Pinehurst. Which is like a place where they take troubled uh, teenagers and kids and fucking try to help them integrate back into society. Kind of like a halfway house, boarding house, something like that I guess you could call it. I'm not for sure. But anyway, they try to help troubled kids to integrate back in with society. So of course they send in Tommy Jarvis there who he doesn't talk any in this movie. And it's kind of like he's real quiet until somebody pisses him off. Then he goes, watch a cha cha ba Fucking jerks out some jiu-jitsu moves. And they're actually not bad. I actually enjoyed that. That's another one of the things I like about this movie. I thought that was just so fucking funny. The way he jerks out like jiu-jitsu moves and beats the shit out of random people who pissed him off. That was just so fucking entertaining. But, um... Uh, 
So he gets there. Uh, like I said, like I said, this film's got a real trashy feel to it. Just such a trashy feel, and not a fun trashy feel. Just such a. And the film feels feels low budget. The film feels more low budget than the first four. It's like they thought, let's just spend a little amount of money on it. Um, throw some money in on a hockey mask, let them kill people, and the fans will be happy because that's all they want. But there's more to a, there's more to a Friday Thirteenth film than just a guy in a hockey mask killing people. I'm sorry, there is. There's atmosphere and stuff like that that you can get, and plus you gotta have at least decent likable characters. I didn't like anybody in this film besides the characters I mentioned. All the rest of them are just cannon fodder, and the characters are written even thinner in here than the first four films. So that right there just made me feel like they were trying to cash in as quick as they could on the success of this franchise. But anyway, so they're taking him there to the place. You got the woman Pam there. She's really nice. The actress does does decent. She's likable. And you got this guy there who like runs the place. He was in one of the Indiana Jones films at the beginning of it. The actor was. Uh, this guy's fine. I would have liked to have actually have seen more of him. Uh, but you don't see shit of him in the movie. But uh. He's fine. You get the Reggie the Reckless there. He's like this little little boy who's like tries to act all tough, but he's really like just a typical little kid. But uh, he he was fine. He was fine. That actor was fine as Reggie the Reckless. And he's got his grandpa there, who like is the cook there. And the other characters, you got uh this girl named Tina, whose real name is Voorhees. She has huge tits. That's the only thing to like about her. She has great tits. That's it. Pretty much it. She has a boyfriend who kind of looks like Tom Cruise, you know, like a young Tom Cruise a little bit, but <laughs> doesn't have his acting talent. Neither one of these characters are likable. They're both douchebags. You don't give a fuck about them. Uh, you got like the this, um, this other character played by played, named Violent, played by Tiffany Helm, whose mom is actually in one of the Nightmare on Elm Street films, the uh, three and four, I believe. Well, two of them, and uh, she does. Her, she's passable. I mean, she looks hot, but other than that. There's not really, she's not really that interesting. She has what well, she has the coolest scene in the movie though. I'll give her that. She has the coolest scene in the film, which I really enjoyed, where she's doing like robot moves. Sorry, I had to bust out my moves there for a minute with my freaky eye. But uh, <laughs> she has uh, she has the coolest scene in the movie doing robot moves like that to the fucking um, Pseudo Echo song. Uh, I forgot what the name of the song was, but that's the name of the band. But uh, the song is really cool. It's like, there's a man with no life in his eyes. <laughs> but that was entertaining. That was cool. I like that scene. Uh, other than that, and other than Ethel and Junior who are really funny, uh, there's nothing else to this movie. And the movie's just like so choppily, choppily put together. It's just like underwritten in certain areas and just thrown together. Nudity for the sake of just having nudity. The nudity in this film feels so trashy and just feels so thrown in, like just to have it. You know, like in the other films, it made sense. The fucking did with the teenagers, them being teenagers, and they want to fuck. And I have no problem with nudity seeing it, but you're going to have it in your film. At least write it to where it makes sense. Don't just have it thrown in there to where it just seems like you're wanting to throw it in there just to have nudity. But, uh, like I said, by trashiness, you got, like, when they're taking Tommy to Pinehurst, one of the, like, fucking guys in the vehicle is, like, reading a porno magazine. <laughs> and then when they get there, this, <laughs> you, get a, you get a scene where there's, like, Okay, okay, all these kids are troubled kids, right? They're all troubled kids. And you got, like, this one dude who looks like a psychopathic murderer who has, like, anger problems, like, so bad that if you accidentally stepped on his toe, he'd probably rip your head off and shit down your throat. And they got this guy chopping chopping the wood with a big axe. Chopping the wood with a big axe. That's stupid. That is lazy writing right there. That is so fucking stupid. And you got this fat, obnoxious kid who walks up to him. He's kind of sweet, but he's also really obnoxious, and he keeps saying, I got a chocolate bar. You want to share the chocolate bar with me? You know you do. You want some of this chocolate bar? Come on. I got I got an extra one. Let's not tell the girls about it. He's like, leave me alone. <laughs> and he's, he's like, okay, if that's the way you feel, Vic, just forget it. <laughs> he turns around to walk off and fucking psycho. He, like, why would he be making this guy angry and this dude like a fucking nutcase? And why would he have an axe chopping the wood? That's so stupid. And the... <laughs> Fat obnoxious guy turns around and he fucking gets hacked in the back by the psychopathic dude with an axe who when he shouldn't have an axe. So the fat kid's dead. Then you get these two fucking paramedics come in there and you get a funny scene here. I like this. The film has some black comedy in it, which I enjoy. You got this dude who's like, look, one of the paramedics bends in there and is like looking at the body and one of the uh, teenagers there is like, like makes a face or starts going, oh, like turns away and he's like, bunch of pushes. <laughs> bunch of pussies. Oh, that was funny. I, I like that. That was funny. Um, 
Then you got, like, they try to play up a mystery angle here about who's the killer, but this is played up so bad. It's so fucking obvious who the killer is. Like, they got this character named Rory there. He's one of the ambulance drivers, or paramedics, uh, and he fucking looks down at the body, and one of the other guys looking at him, and he's like, come on, Roy, get your hands dirty. And he fucking raises up his uh, face. He's got, like, a psychotic look on his face like this. Fucking like the camera just like zooms in at him. You you know from right there it's establishing this guy is the killer. So there's no fucking mystery to this movie. But anyway, so you got that. You obviously know that this guy's the killer. You carry on with the rest of the film here. You got the two. You got well. Oh yeah, Ethel and Junior, baby. I can't forget him. I cannot forget him. You got this woman named Ethel. She comes there and she's got a kid named Junior who keeps riding on this fucking bike, and uh, she's like a. Talking about the the two uh, asshole characters, Tino, Tino, well, Tino, Tina and Eddie, who keep going around and fucking on her property, literally fucking on her property. But uh, and she tells them that the next person she catches there, she's gonna blow their fucking brains out. The sheriff is there, and the, and uh, he like reaches to touch her, and she's like, "Don't touch me, sheriff! I got a bomb on me. I blow us all up." And I I thought that was so fucking funny. I don't know what this actress's name is, but she's fucking hilarious here. And uh, her son. Uh, fucking Junior keeps going, say it like you mean it, Ma. <laughs> That's just so funny. I love these two. I almost wish they were the stars of the film. But uh, they leave. And then Tina and Eddie, you get a scene where they decide to go out and fuck again. So they're out trying to fuck in the woods. And uh, you get this fucking, uh, well, they fuck and it's like a 30 second scene. You don't even see anything. So he goes, he leaves. Uh, and then she gets killed by gardening shears. Uh, imposter Jason stabs him down into her eyeballs and fucking clenches them together. Pretty decent effect. You don't see it, but you get enough. I mean, you hear enough. Uh, you get to hear it, like when he and see like him push the things together. So it's entertaining enough. And then Tom Cruise wannabe comes back. Um, he finds her dead there. Then he leans up back against the tree. I like this death scene. I do like this one where he's standing there in front of a tree and from behind it, uh, the imposter Jason throws a fucking, well, I'll just call him Rory. Rory throws a fucking strap around his head and then twists this stick on it and like uh, twists it until it breaks and it's like stick, grinds deeper and deeper into his face until he's dead. That was cool. That was an inventive kill. I like that kill. That was cool. A lot of the kills in this film are edited like a lot. You don't really see much of the violence in this film from the kills, especially compared to part four. The death scene seems like a really look, big letdown in this one. And uh, like I feel, like I said, the film has a really trashy, like low budget TV quality to it, which I don't like. So those two are dead, and you got this one character in the film who shows up at the fucking Ethel's house, telling her he'll clean up chicken shit and everything. And he just shows up there, wanting well, selling her clean, telling her he'll clean up chicken shit. She gives him something to eat. So I'm like, okay, maybe this guy's gonna mean something for this film. You know, he just showed up, knew he's a new character, maybe he's got something to do with something. But no, he was just out in the woods watching Tina and Eddie fuck. He turned around, got stabbed in the gut, fell over and died. So I'm like. That's such worthless writing and such a worthless character. What the fuck was that? That was so, so lazy. So fucking lazy. But anyway, back at the place, you got, uh, oh, oh, baby, I gotta remember this. You got a scene here where he got a uh, fucking Tommy Jarvis is down there and then, uh, Oh, uh, before the character of Eddie died, he's like got one of Tommy's masks and he's like hits him with it and he's like, "Can't you take a joke, man? Huh? Why? Uh, what's the matter, Chief?" And then he fucking flies off, starts beating the shit out of him and slings him, picks him up over his shoulder, slings him against the wall, drops him down on the ground, starts punching him in the face. That was fucking epic. I love that. I hated the Tom Cruise wannabe guy, and I was just so glad that he Tommy Jarvis was beating the fuck out of him before the guy who runs the place stopped the fight, well, stopped the beating and broke it up. That was entertaining. I enjoyed that. But uh, you got Reggie the Reckless, and he's got his wants to see his uh, see his brother in the film. I believe it's his brother, M M Miguel A. Nunez plays him. I like Miguel Nunez. He's an actor I enjoy. I like him in Return of the Dead. Fuck it, I even liked him in Juana, Man. I'll admit it. Uh, <laughs> but I like him. So Reggie and uh Tommy and Pam go to visit him. So they're going over to his name's the character's name is Demon. He's got like a fucking looks like a Jerry curl, I believe, which I find that funny. So they go to visit him, um, then Junior of all people shows up there, Junior's like fucking with Tommy, calling him like a crazy guy from the loony bin, Tommy flies off, beats the fuck out of Junior in some fancy ass looking jujitsu moves, and it's, once again, I love this shit, this is so fucking funny, it's, it's hilarious, I love it, so, um, and Junior rides off out of there, Tommy takes off running, you don't see him again until the end of the movie. Uh, I guess to make you think he was the killer, but it never worked on me. I never thought he was the killer. 
But uh, you guys seen earlier in the movie like these two fucking greasers who show up out of nowhere are just like on the side of the road and their car quits and one of them walks into the forest to like take a shit. He walks like half a mile into the woods to take a shit. I'm like, okay, why are you walking that far to take a shit? But whatever. <laughs> so then the, Rory decides to kill both these two motherfuckers anyway, even though they had nothing to do with what uh, with his kid's death. The fat kid is his kid, so that's why he's killing everybody. And he's using like the the Jason look and everything to cover up uh, to cover up uh, for the murders to make people think it's Jason, I guess. But, uh, why is he killing two greasers? I don't get that. Why the fuck is he till killing these two random fucking greasers on the side of the road? Um, people might say he's crazy, so he's just killing anybody he happens to run into contact with. But he seems pretty hell-bent in most of the parts of the movie of attacking the people at the Pinehurst house. So this makes kind of no sense. It just seems like it's thrown in there for moral body count. Kills one guy by sticking a road flare in his mouth. Okay, decent scene, but you can tell it's a fake head. He kills him. The other guy comes back, gets in the vehicle. He gets his throat slit from behind the behind the seat. That's entertaining. I enjoyed that. So the two greasers are dead. Uh, <laughs> while they're in this film, they don't fit at all. I don't know. I mean, like two greasers randomly showing up in a Friday the 13th movie. Looks like two guys from a fucking West Side Story or something. But whatever. Then you get the scene where these two people are at this diner. And once again, why the fuck is Roy targeting people at a random diner? But whatever. And uh, the girl is like in there getting ready to go out with uh. Well, the guy is actually the guy that was driving Tommy to Pinehurst at the beginning of the movie. But uh, the girl in there is like her name's the character's name is Lana. She's like getting dressed and she just all at once just pulls her uh, shirt open like that and shows her tits like right in front of the camera and goes, "It's showtime." And I'm like. That's such thrown in nudity. I mean, they're nice tits. I don't hate them or anything, but the way it's thrown in like that is just so stupid. But uh, and then she starts walking around in there, and then she gets scared by the fucking jump scare cat. The fucking jump scare cat. I hate this shit. I don't like jump scare cat. How does the jump scare cat keep getting movie roles? I'm sick of jump scare cat. I wish he would be fired from horror films for eternity, but he keeps coming back. But you get jump scare cat, and the dude outside uh, gets axed in the top of the head. It's an okay scene, but it cuts like really quick, and you don't hardly see anything. Like I said, this film feels really cut compared to part four. She comes outside, and she's out there. The Roy shows up, fucking hacks her in the gut, and you don't even see anything. She just falls over dead, and it's, it's, just the look of that like part of the movie makes the, gives the film like just the way the coloring is done. Uh, just makes it look, uh, well, just the visual of it, I mean, just makes it look like a low-budget TV movie, kind of, for me, in that part of the movie. But, uh, all through the movie, you get scenes where, like, Tommy Jarvis is, like, looking and seeing like, real Jason, like, his hallucination of him popping up at different spots in the movie. And that was entertaining. I like that. I like the way uh, the actor played him. I believe his name, once again, I believe his name is John Shepard, but don't quote me on that. But the actor did a good job uh, doing that. I don't mind this guy. He's fine. I don't mind him at all. But uh, he does fine. <clears throat> He, like, grabs his head and everything like he's, like, freaking out as he sees, like, a hallucination of uh, real Jason. Uh, so that was entertaining. Um, uh, after uh, Reggie the Reckless and Pam leave to go look for Tommy, you got fucking uh, Demon there and his girlfriend. His girlfriend gets killed off screen and Demon's in his outhouse. And uh, I like this death scene. This is another death scene I enjoy. Uh, Roy is fucking stabbing, like, his uh, metal spike through the outhouse and stabs him once in the leg, goes straight through his leg. And then uh, he's standing like a uh, – he's got his back to the outhouse, and, of course, Roy stabs it from the back, and it goes straight through it, straight, like, out his chest, or right out, like, right below his chest, straight out of it, like that, I believe. That was entertaining. I enjoyed that. Uh, that was a cool death scene. So Miguel Nunez is dead, so they're looking for Tommy. Um, they're heading back to the Pinehurst place. You got Junior, who's riding around on his bike, telling, telling Mama – or Ethel to uh, fucking kill him because they he because they beat the shit out of him or Tommy did anyway. He's annoying as fuck right here. He screams way too much. He's riding around. He gets a cleaver to the head and his head comes flying off. I enjoyed that. I'm just so fucking glad he's dead. And then uh, Ethel gets killed by a really badly cut death scene where the fucking cleaver just comes straight towards the camera like that. Sticks her in the head. She squeezes a mater and she falls over dead. You hardly see anything and it's cut so quick. It's just so fucking stupid. But uh, they're so fucking weak. So she's dead. Uh, back at Pinehurst, you got a uh, guy who runs the place. I think his character's name was Matt. And him and the, the guy that was the cook there, who's Reggie the Reckless's grandpa, both fucking left. So uh, you got them two. They just leave. You see their dead bodies later on in the movie. So they just got killed off screen. So I'm like, lame. But uh, so Pam is still going around looking for Tommy. Reggie the Reckless is staying there at Pinehurst. You got uh, this girl named Robin who's like being a douchebag to this boy who's got like a stuttering problem. He tells her that he tells her that he wants to fuck her, 
I make love to her, as he puts it. And uh, she, like, starts laughing at him. And he goes in the hallway, and he gets killed by the meat cleaver again in a badly cut scene where it just comes straight towards him like that, just whack straight down, and it cuts away, and he's dead. I'm like, brilliant. Just fucking brilliant. But, uh, <laughs> sarcasm, everybody. But, um, so he's dead. <laughs> Robin goes up to her room. She gets, takes off her clothes, gets in her bed, gets ready to lay down. And she doesn't pull the cover over her breasts. She just has her breasts sticking out. Um, so again, that seems so, so fucking trashy. I don't, once again, I don't mind the tits. I don't mind them, but it just feels so stupid the way it's done. And so lazy. But, uh, and then she gets stabbed from underneath her bed. Once again, same shit we've seen in one and three. And so she gets stabbed underneath her bed. It's a Voorhees signature thing. And so Roy's copying it. So she gets stabbed from underneath her bed. You don't even see it go all the way through her. You just see him stab it from underneath the bed. And then it cuts away and she's dead. So I'm like, again, what a pussy fucking death scene. Worthless. Um, after that, you got Violet now who's going to get killed. She does her dance moves, which are cool. And then Roy comes in there and fucking pins her up against the wall and just stabs her in the gut. And she's dead. I'm like, okay, lame. Another lame stabbing. So she's dead. Uh, Reggie discovers the bodies in Tommy Jarvis's room. Uh, Pam meets up with Reggie. Uh, they start getting scared, and then Roy busts through the door. And the door you get like another Jason movies, like the doors get knocked down or they get blown like to pieces or something. But in this film, the door gets literally obliterated. It's like he just barely touched it and it just completely evaporated in front of the camera. I thought that was so stupid, but that's just me, I guess. I don't, I'm not really heard anybody else complain about it. So Roy's going to chase after them. They manage to make it out there. They run through the woods. Find uh, the other paramedic that said, Roy, get your hands dirty. He's dead in his uh, vehicle. Uh, and they run back to the woods. They discover Matt and uh, Matt's dead body there. Like He's got a nail through his head against a tree. So that was his character was useless. Um, well, he mounted the shit. Like he, I don't mind him getting killed. But I just wish it would have been a better death scene than that. Um, instead of just seeing the aftermath. So... They Pam makes it back to uh, makes it back to the fucking house or back to Pinehurst. I mean, back to the Pinehurst house. Um, Pam's there. Uh, Roy's still chasing after her. Reggie the Reckless saves her by fucking hitting him with a bulldozer, which I thought was decently entertaining. I enjoyed that. So Roy gets knocked down. Of course, Roy ain't dead. He gets up. They run into a barn. Uh, Tommy show, uh, she starts fighting Roy with a fucking chainsaw, but the chainsaw of course quits. I'm like, that's such a cliche. <laughs> the same thing happened in part two, now it's happened again. That feels so lazy. The chainsaw just quits and just runs out of gas. So she slings it at him. And so that's done. Uh, of course, Roy gets back up. Um, they climb up to the top of the barn. Roy's there, getting ready to come after him. Tommy shows up, so you know, you know Tommy's not the killer. So obviously it's fucking Roy. Or Roy, I mean. And uh, Tommy's there. Uh, Roy just walks up to him, slices him, I guess Tommy thought he was having a hallucination, so Tommy gets sliced and he stabs Roy like almost in the dick with a knife. <laughs> so Tommy manages to make it up there to the top of the barn where Pam and Reggie are. Roy starts following him, he makes it up there. Oh, before I forget, you got another scene in the movie that fucking showed you that Roy was the killer again. When the sheriff is there with the dead bodies, he's like, uh, what, what the hell's going on around here? <laughs> and, uh, or something like that, and uh, Roy's like walking behind him and he goes, you talking to me, sheriff? Uh, and he's like, no, Roy, and he's like, oh, I thought he was talking to me. And it's like, obviously, he's the fucking killer. This is the most weak, worthless, done mystery I've ever seen in a film. It's thus far. But anyway, back to the end here. Uh, oh, another thing in that scene, I almost, I don't want to mention, I don't want to forget to mention this. You got a spot there in that same scene where this dude's like acting is so cheesy and so bad. He walks up to him, he's like, he's got his hat on. He's like a deputy, and he's like, I guess we got us some maniac on the loose, huh, Sheriff? And he, like, tips up his hat, and I'm like, that was so fucking stupid. And then at the end of the movie, back to where I was, Roy makes it up there. He thinks Tommy's dead, gets ready to kill Reggie. Pam hits him in the back, and uh, he fucking falls down from the barn. You think he's fell down, but he's, like, holding on to the edge of it. Tommy hacks him in the arm with a machete, and uh, he fucking falls down on these conveniently placed spikes at the bottom of the barn. So Roy's dead. The hockey mask is off. You find out it's Roy. The Roy hockey mask has blue triangles instead of red to show you that it's probably a different killer. So Roy's dead. Skip to the end. You're at the hospital. Pam is there. Reggie's asleep. They're all fine. Tommy is there. Tommy has another. Uh, you get another dream sequence here, and we think it. We think uh, 
Well, you see Pam, you see the sheriff talking to Pam. Then you skip to the next scene, Pam is walking in to check on Tommy, and then Tommy stabs her in the gut like you think he's went crazy. So then it skips, and it's fucking, then you know it's, I mean, it skips to Tommy waking up so you know it was a dream sequence, but I thought it was cool because it's Tommy having a dream, and the scene focused on Pam. I actually enjoyed that. It kind of threw me off a little bit. So then you get uh, Tommy having one last hallucination of Jason, but this time kind of like, seems like he's embracing Jason a little bit. Uh, and then he gets up, and I'll, ne I'll never forget the movie for this. Fucking the killer's hockey mask is in the patient's room in the drawer. I'm like, okay, that is so fucking stupid and so lazy. Just such a stupid way for him to get the hockey mask. And I don't even like the idea of Tommy going crazy and using the hockey mask. If he's going to be a killer too, give him a different fucking mask. But, um, I know it seems like it might be like a tradition thing to have him with the hockey mask too, since Jason had it. But Mrs. Voorhees never had the hockey mask. And Jason's made it the, that that iconic, I mean, that hockey mask iconic, so Tom, I don't want Tommy to be just a Jason copycat, make him a different killer. It makes sense for Roy to, uh, or Roy to try to be a Jason copycat because he's trying to cover up his murders, but not Tommy. I mean, fuck, give him something more. Well, I know Tommy was traumatized by Jason, but fuck it. You know, try to change it up a little bit. Shit, make it to where he, I mean, he creates masks. Let him make his own mask. But, um, so the hockey mask being there is so fucking stupid. But uh, then Pam walks into the room. The window's broken. You think Tommy has escaped. Uh, and then all at once from behind the door, the door closes. And Tommy's standing there with a the butcher knife like this. Like he's getting ready to stab her. And the camera focuses straight in on him. And it's over. Uh, that was a decent ending. I actually enjoyed that. Uh, makes you kind of ponder. I like the way it ended. Like you thought Tommy broke out of the window, but he didn't. That was actually decent. I actually kind of like that. Uh, score for this film. Uh, one star and a half. This is a bad movie. It's not a good movie at all. I can still enjoy it on some level just because I'm such a Friday 13th fan. It's just, it's stupid, but it's stupid fun. Uh, part 6 is way better than this film. 1 through 4 are better than this film by far. This is the weakest film in the franchise. I, I don't hate, I don't hate this movie, but I don't like it either. It's not a good film at all, and it's not a good Friday 13th film either. Uh, but it's not absolutely horrible. One star and a half, to be honest, is being slightly generous. But, uh... But yeah, uh, even the title sequence at the beginning of it, when you, every Fire 13 film has a cool title sequence. The one in this one is too much like part four. Instead, you get the hockey mask. I mean, you get the, instead of the hockey mask blowing up like the beginning of part four and then the final chapter appearing. And this one is uh, a new beginning appears and then it blows up and the, the hockey mask appears. <laughs> that was so stupid. Just seemed like they were trying to do the same thing from part four and not do their own kind of invention. But in this one, you get the hockey mask, it like spins completely around and the camera goes straight through the eye hole of it. Which I thought that was kind of neat. That was kind of neat. I'll give it that. That was kind of neat. But everything else was too reminiscent of Part 4, and I hated that. That was stupid. But yeah, just to cap this off, this is a one and a half star film. Well, I guess a one and a half star ain't being generous. I guess it deserves that. It's not absolutely horrible. I get some entertainment out of the few of the characters, especially Ethel and Junior. Well, especially Ethel. She's funny. But uh, Tommy, he's alright. The actor did fine. Uh, Pam, she's decent. Uh, and Reggie the Reckless is fun. He's a fun character, especially when he runs Jason over, or runs imposter Jay Rory over with a fucking bulldozer. Uh, other than that, there's nothing really to this film. So I'll see you guys again with a much better movie. And uh, if you're a Friday 13th fan, I recommend watching this film just to say you've seen them all. And I don't think you'll enjoy it. I really don't see how you could. But, uh, I mean, if you like the film, that's fine. But me personally, I could, I could hardly give a shit about it. So I'll see you guys again with Friday 13th Part 6.